स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Good morning. So today's class is all about classic Hollywood. We have been talking about new Hollywood for quite a while, but um, it's very important to understand the golden age of Hollywood because uh, it has had such far-reaching influences on cinema of all parts of the world, especially on our cinema, our own classic uh, uh, Indian cinema. We will also be talking about the studio system in Hollywood and while talking about the golden age and classic Hollywood, we will talk about plot and characterization uh, in the movies of that period. Narrative structure, we have alway, already given plenty of emphasis on na narrative structure, so you are no stranger to that and editing techniques. We will also talk about uh, a censorship code called the Hayes code, which was also popularly called the production code during the classic Hollywood period and we will look at uh, what brought about this code. Key persons for today's lecture would be um, Cecil DeMille, the man behind a number of epics, especially most importantly Ten Commandments. Frank Apra, it is a wonderful life and many more and William Wyler, who uh, film scholars, film historians believe is one of the most sophisticated filmmakers of this period. So, I am going to um, discuss more <coughs> directors from this period, but I hope to cover these directors in today's class. Um, so, what was this thing called production code? Now, uh, there was a thing called MPPDA motion pictures producers and distributors of America, which was established in 1922 headed by Will Hayes, an ultra conservative Republican. And what was it uh, meant for? Uh, so, MPPDA was a self regulatory trade organization formed by Hollywood producers. And we will talk about what brought it about, what, was, what, what were those factors which led to uh, the establishment of Hayes Code. By 1934, this thing was called Hayes Code and Will Hayes was in charge of the production code. It is widely believed that Hollywood's so called golden age, the, the period that we are going to discuss today begin with the code and ended with the code. Once the code was lifted, the, uh, the classic or the golden age was also over technically. Now, uh, let us talk, we will talk about what brought about that code, but then first let us talk about the plot structure and narrative in the classic Hollywood cinema. So, if you look, uh, if you consider some of the great movies of that period. Buster Keaton, we have already been talking about Buster Keaton general and all, Charlie Chaplin's all classics, ok. We are still on silent cinema. So, uh, things, uh, think how th things were organized in classic Hollywood period, the plot structure. Events were organized around a basic structure. We are not talking about multiple narratives, there was a basic enigma around which events were organized. Aristotelian plot concept was followed to the T. So, a story necessarily must have had a beginning, a middle and an end. And most importantly, this you have to remember cause and effect relationship between events. This happened and therefore, as a result of this something happened, cause and effect. There was a disruption, there has to be a conflict, we have been talking about the importance of having conflict in cinema, if you remember, okay. And then 
uh, uh, plot should move in such a way that the conflict should be resolved and equilibrium should be uh, restored. You can always think of more contemporary cinema which violate all these uh, tenets. Whatever the genre and we will be soon discussing genre in uh, cinema as well, the plot always offered a closure, there had to be a satisfactory ending, it cannot be open ended. And this is very important, please pay attention, uh, uh, the ending should always have a closure with a message that would cater to the dominant ideology. Now, can you give me example of catering to the dominant ideology? Plot should have a closure and closure should have be should uh, do, cater to the dominant ideology of the period. Give me an example. Casablanca. Louder. Casablanca. Casablanca, okay. She goes not with yeah, and dominant ideology was that sanctity of marriage should be upheld. Casablanca, he is talking about patriotism, nation before love. Okay. So, th those are the ideologies and they had to be respected and there has to be a closure. The woman leaves with her husband, yes, that is the end. The man stays back and takes the responsibility, whatever are the consequences, he, is, he has to face them. Okay, so, catering to the domin dominant ideology of the period. Okay. Linearity of a structure, so plot would always be linear and not jump back and forth in time. While you are making notes about all this, please keep in mind the new Hollywood and more avant-garde experimental cinema. Okay. How uh, the more experimental kind of cinema violated all these conditions. It was also believed that uh, classic Hollywood, because of its uh, linear plot structure and because uh, of its believ the creation of a believable world was uh, very close to realism. So, we have also talked about realist cinema. So, cinema should be realistic and why it was really realistic, because it had a beginning like life, you know, not, uh, not exactly like life, but uh, um, the way we read a book, the way we would read an article, it should be, it, sh it should have a beginning, middle and an end and it should have cause and effect, therefore, it is real. And also it was very important to observe temporal spatial coherence set in believable world, worlds and in believable time. Okay. Again in order to achieve the concept of verisimilitude that is reality, as close to realism as possible. Not real, uh, exactly realistic cinema, but close to <coughs> reality and therefore, you know um, audience would be more involved, the empathy sympathy factor should be there. So, more adhering to the Aristotelian <coughs> concept of uh, yes plot and not the Brechtian concept of plot, which was like breaking of the fourth wall and uh, forcing the audience to think that came much later. Now, characters after plot, what were the uh, characters all about? So, plot should be propelled through the agency of believable characters, they should be lifelike and who are the most believable characters? The middle class. Okay. So, make a movie around the lives of the middle class people a regular American family. Uh, so, Frank Capra was a master of that. Okay. Uh, it happened one night, it is a wonderful life, okay. think of all those movies. He even made a movie called Meet John Doe. Now, who is John Doe? An average man, an every man. Okay. So, believable characters. Characters should be well rounded with certain traits. And it is important in a classic narrative that the central character should be the hero and therefore, believe in hero. There should be a hero and a movie cannot do without hero. Therefore, the creation of the so called stardom, okay, we need to have 
stars so that we can have believable heroes. We will be talking about other aspects also the structure, the editing techniques etcetera of the golden age Hollywood period. But before that let me draw your attention to one of the most influential, most successful and biggest uh, showman of that period Cecil B. DeMille 1881 to 1959. who was possibly the first ever showman in cinema. Of course, we had D. W. Griffiths also the father of cinema, but uh, Griffiths of course, uh, uh, was a big inventor and he, his contribution to cinema, especially the early stages of cinema is tremendous. But why do we think Cecil B. DeMille was a showman? What does a showman do? Who is Name some showman from our part of the world. Tara, who is a showman in cinema? No, no, give me some examples. Shankar is a showman, okay, from Tamil cinema. Yes, Chopra is a showman. Sanjay Leela Bhansali is a showman. Um, so those of you who are familiar with the cinema, especially Hindi cinema of the 40s and 50s and even 60s would know that uh, Raj Kapoor was also called the greatest showman of Hindi cinema. Okay. Now, what are the attributes if we think Raj Kapoor or uh, we never say Satyajit Ray was a showman. Okay. So, what are what could be the characteristics of a showman? So, Raj Kapoor is a showman, Bhansali, Yash Chopra. What kind of filmmakers are they? Of course, all great filmmakers, but what are their qualification? What are their qualities? Grand sets and larger than life, grand <coughs> sets, okay. a very visible, highly publicized kind of films. Okay, so, that they are there. So, they are not, they are no believers, no adherence to low key, off beat, low budget cinema. Okay. They believed in making cinema which was larger than life. Of course, that, uh, and something that appealed to the masses. Okay, there should be they should reach out to as many people as possible. Another great uh, showman of the 70s and the 80s in Bollywood was uh, someone called Manmohan Desai, who made blockbusters like Amar Akbar Anthony. Does that name uh, sound familiar? Amar Akbar Anthony, Kuli, etc. Okay, so Manmohan Desai was a showman. And he was a blatant showman. He said, I exist not to make, you know, not to bore people with uh, realities of India and to show poverty, etcetera. I want to create a world of make believe. And he was uh, a self confessed believer in making that kind of cinema, which we today term as escapist cinema. Okay, so, most of the, these showmen I believe are, uh, are those who adhere to making the so called adhere, uh, um, escapist cinema, okay. make people forget for two and a half or three hours their harsh realities of life, okay. take them to a, uh, to a fantasy world, okay. to a beautiful world. Okay. Um, Cecil B. DeMille's movies incarnate all the values of Hollywood, what Hollywood should be all about. That is what DeMille believed in. Uh, his first major movie was the score man and it is popularly called the first feature length western ever made in Hollywood. And western you all know is a very popular genre, the first feature length, first full fledged uh, Western in Hollywood was made by Cecil DeMille, okay, which was the first ever Western, the great train robbery, which was just a 10 minutes feature. Okay. Then after that DeMille made a series of patriotic films, The Little American, Joan, The Woman, Till I Come Back to You, all uh, made uh, uh, during the second decade of the 20th century. 
he also made a, a couple of comedy of manners and you can look at the titles of these films old wives for new do not change your husband okay. why change your wife okay. so those were the titles and uh, uh, it takes you back to the comedy of manners to the restoration comedy uh, period of uh, um, when people like Weisherle and William Congreve were writing their plays way of the world etcetera okay. the country wife so he drew inspiration from that genre of comedy of manners his movie the sign of the cross uh, is based on a particular episode from the bible in 1932 and then you would soon find that he became a master of this genre okay, taking stories from that period and this was a pre court period and the heroine um, Claudette Colbert who later on uh, starred in a hugely successful movie called it happened one night Clark Gable okay. and it was a sensational movie a movie of epic dimension and <coughs> it was definitely a pre code movie and there are plenty of scenes if you look up the movie and take down uh, look at some of the images you will understand what I am talking about so definitely pre code cinema so therefore when we talk about pre code and post code Hollywood there is a huge difference pre cold Hollywood cinema was much more liberal um, and exhibitionistic in its depiction of sex and violence on screen whereas post code became much more conservative. So, when you watch movies by Frank Capra for example you understand I mean uh, the other day I was giving you example from Hitchcock's notorious there is a famous kiss between Ingrid Bergman and Cary Grant and there was the code which said that a kiss cannot last for more than 2 seconds or 3 seconds on screen. So, what he did he uh, uh, shot a long kiss and then cut it in between. So, they would speak a bit and then would cut a kiss again. So, you technically they are kissing for only 1 or 2 seconds right, but then that uh, sequence lasted for about uh, 30 seconds or even more. Okay, so, that is an interesting story how people would actually work around the code which was so dreaded. <coughs> Following the hay code now what do you do when you have something like hay code and when you are about to lose your audience. So, uh, uh, Dimmel directed his most popular movie the ten commandments a religious epic and if you watch the ten commandments you will find it has all the facets of a typical Demil movie, but it has a veneer of religion there ok. So, that is another way of working around the code. So, you give the audience what they are looking for, but then it tells a religious story you see. So, you can get away with that uh, the movie was produced by Paramount Productions in 1923 and then he went on to direct a couple of very big budget spectacles king of kings which is a Jesus movie 1927 uh, the first Cleopatra not the Taylor Burton vehicle 1934 and Samson and Delilah and do watch Samson and Delilah to understand what Cecil de Mill believed in. Any comments on Cecil de Mill before we go on to discuss the studio system. Yeah. The technology used there rather than for the visual effects. Yeah. For Moses parting yeah. the Red Sea. Yeah. So, uh, that is what we uh, mean when we say that he believed in big budget productions. Yeah. So, yes, technology, he would spend money. Yeah. It is something like the first Star Wars movie. Like first? It is something like it is something as path breaking as the first Star Wars. As in for that time, the technology used in the movie was impressive. Impressive, yeah. So, technically advanced movie, but then you you see there was a formula. I am talking about Cecil B. DeMille formula, and all these so called showmen always adhere to a certain formula. So, when I talk to you about Raj Kapoor, then Raj Kapoor had a formula uh, the underdog versus the capitalists, right. 
Okay, and that is something you will find in the cinema of Chaplin, who was uh, almost like uh, his uh, guru. Um, Raj Kapoor blindly worshipped Charlie Chaplin, okay, followed his style, his cinematic style, most of his theme. He was called our tramp, the Indian tramp. Okay, if you watch the movies of Frank Capra, there is a formula again, the little man against the system, the establishment, the corrupt system. Meet John Doe, Gary Cooper's one of the best movies ever made. Watch it. Okay, so the, all these showmen follow a formula. DeMille's formula was also he believed in making big epics, big budget, colorful, lots of tech, uh, technical inventions, innovations introduced, thrown in. Okay, but the basic formula remained the same. Okay, so idea was to sensationalize certain elements. If you read a film history, you will understand other apart from his apparent uh, qualities, there was an underlying formula aiming for a big success. Okay, so, let us talk about the studio system. So, MGM, it was managed by the grand Louis B. Mayer, the man who was uh, the force behind or the Oscar, the Academy Awards. Okay. Irving Thalberg was the renowned production manager, who worked for the MGM studio along with David O. Selznick. And Thalberg and Selznick produced some of the greatest films of that period. Thalberg, perhaps you may not be familiar with Thalberg too much, but uh, he has been immortalized by a great American novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald in a novel called The Last Tycoon, which was one of the last films directed by Alaya Kazan starring a very young Robert De Niro in, and where he played Irving Thalberg, The Last Tycoon. The screenplay uh, was by another great uh, literateur, Harold Pinter, dramatist. Um, so, MGM was the most prosperous and most prolific studios. I mean, their money, they had unlimited access to resources, funds and actors and had most of the biggest directors and stars under contract. Remember the studio system, they would have stars and directors under contract. They, that means, they could not work for outside studios. That is not the case today. Anyone is free to be uh, to work with anyone, because today they have they uh, all stars, all directors, all screenwriters, they employ agents, who will seek them, who will seek work for them. Okay. It was not like they, they are compelled to work for a particular studio, no matter how lousy the script is, but that happened at one point. And many stars had to fight the studio system to uh, break the control they would exercise on their lives. MGM publicity machine okay, and that is what they believed in, more stars than there are in heaven, because they had virtually everyone under their contract. Their style, which was uh, uh, very common and uh, it, that is again that is an, an MGM formula, you watch an, an MGM movie and you will understand, there is always high key lights. We were talking at one point about some lights, some sets are designed particularly to make people prettier than what they really are. So, MGM believed in prettifying people. Okay. So, high lighting, high key lighting and illuminating. So, everything should be pretty. Opulent productions, no money would be spared on anything. The great Elizabeth Taylor, she made her debut with an MGM production. She was a child artist, she worked in a couple of forgettable movies, especially um, Jane Eyre, where she was not Jane Eyre, someone else played Jane Eyre, she played the kid who dies, Helen I think, <laughs> one of the orphan friends. But then soon, she got her major break with Elizabeth Taylor's first movie. She was a child star, but as a child star, she made it big with Hollywood history, National Velvet, National Velvet, which was a children's novel, and uh, 
a very popular children's novel and she got the part and then there after that there was no looking back. So, she was one of their prime uh, major stars. So, major genres of MGM were musicals, you are all familiar with musicals, singing in the rain is an MGM production, melodrama okay, and I am going to ask you soon what is melodrama. So, perhaps for tomorrow's lecture come prepared with definitions of melodrama and some good examples of melodrama okay, uh, particularly from Hollywood and they also specialized in adaptation of prestigious literary works. So, if there is a novel, if there is David Copperfield going around then MGM would be the first to adapt it as a movie, so that was the idea. Uh, they continued their reign till 1973, after that it ceased to be a studio, but major films and there are a number of major films and Anna Christie, Grand Hotel, Anna Karenina all is starring who? Greta Garbo, the grand great great Greta Garbo, someone a Hollywood star you should know, you should be familiar with Greta Garbo, even Camille Greta Garbo. Goodbye Mr. Chips, the wizard of Oz needs no introduction, gone with the wind, the ultimate American national epic produced by who? David O. Selznick. Okay, so, and directed by you would know Victor Fleming, who also directed Wizard of Oz. So, Victor Fleming, okay, so these are the names you should be uh, acquainted with. So, oh, oh, it, there is a closure, there is a closure that she has been left, but she is such a determined little lead, lady that tomorrow is another day. She is going to have him back. That is the way the novel ends. So, adaptation of a literary classic, high keel uh, lighting, illuminating lighting, okay, big budget, wonderful costumes, great stars. I mean the publicity machinery, they had Clark Gable of course, they have Olivia D. Havilland and um, but Vivian Lay was a casting coup okay, and they had launched a, a great publicity campaign to get the right leading lady for this particular, pe, particular film. And there are all kinds of stories if you read uh, Hollywood history then you will understand that uh, what a big drama MGM created um, when he launched his search for the perfect leading uh, lady, the scarl his, his Scarlet O'Hara for this movie. Leslie Howard, Olivia D. Havilland and Leslie Howard who played Ashley Wilkes in the movie. So, a big star cast of course and big budget, look at the sets and production design and a very lavishly mounted uh, the, the burning of Atlanta for example, if you remember that scene, it is one of the major highlights of the scene of the movie. And uh, we are told that uh, Vivian Lee arrived on the sets and David O. Selznick first set his eyes on Vivian Lee when Atlanta was burning, the sets were burning okay. and then she looks at him and she raises her chin, she lifts her chin and her green eyes, Vivian Lee had green eyes and Selznick says here is my scarlet okay. So, all the you perhaps this is true, perhaps this is not true, okay, because, but then it makes a good story, right. When you feed this story to uh, the eager public who are just waiting that who is going to be the next scar of the, the great Scarlet O'Hara and when you give them this story, she, Vivian Lee was an unknown, she had just acted in a couple of British movies along with her then companion, later husband Lawrence Olivier. So, she was not a major star in Hollywood, but you need to create that hype, right. So, you just say that she just arrived when Atlanta was burning and then I looked at her and her green eyes and on the spot I decided this is Scarlett O'Hara. <laughs> so, that is the way. Now, Gone with the Wind of course, is a great movie based on a great uh, novel by Margaret Mitchell, Rebecca directed by Hitchcock. 
again is starring Laurence Olivier and Joan Fontaine. Duel in the Sun is an epic. The leading lady later went on to marry David O. Selznick, Jennifer Jones and uh, the leading man was Gregory Peck. Spellbound, Ingrid Bergman, Gregory Peck and uh, directed by Hitchcock and uh, it had uh, some dream elements and surrealistic elements which were all designed by Salvador Deli. He collaborated on Spellbound. A Star is Born. So, those are the great works by the great David O. Selznick. Now, Paramount, another uh, major studio of uh, that period, founded by Adolf Zucker. As European in its approach as MGM was American. So, that is the difference between the two studios. Most of the Paramount directors, technicians, etcetera, they had come from Germany. They were immigrants who were escaping the uh, oppressive Nazi regime. And as in European tradition, these movies have subtle content, although visually very brilliant. So, as opposed to MGM's in your face content, these are more subtle in tone. Major films and uh, interestingly, they all star the great Marlene Dietrich, directed by Joseph von Sternberg, uh, Morocco, Shanghai Express and The Devil is a Woman. Some Marx Brothers comedies, Animal Crackers, Monkey Business and Duck Soup. I am very sure the Duck Soup uh, is known to some of you at least. Then Monte Carlo and Ninochka, again with the great Garbo, directed by Ernst Lubisch, who was another German immigrant. Warner Brothers, the only studio which was run by a family of brothers. Jack Warner was uh, in charge of production. They did not have as much money as uh, MGM and they imposed a strict code of production, insisted that directors should spend within the stipulated budget. They never overpaid their stars unlike MGM and extremely prolific. Directors were expected to churn out at least five pictures a year. Warner Brothers movies were fast paced and had a tough narrative. Today, they are known for their early gangster pictures, Public Enemy. I am a fugitive from a chain gang starring Paul Muni, Little Caesar and some of the greatest directors of uh, uh, the golden age of Hollywood worked for Warner Brothers, Max Reinhardt fresh from Germany, Michael Curtis who was also German and Mervyn Leroy. Michael Curtis, Casablanca and also the first Mildred Pierce. Warner Brothers produced the first ever talking picture, The Jazz Singer, starring L. Johnson. 20th Century Fox, still around, still around and doing very well. Daryl F. Zanuck was the vice president and they had John Ford as their star director. He made young Mr. Lincoln. The Grapes of Wrath with Henry Fonda, based on a novel by Steinbeck. How Green Was My Valley, again based on a novel by Richard Llewellyn, a Welsh novelist. For 20th Century Fox, Little Shirley Temple was their most bankable star. And who was Little Shirley Temple? 
a hugely popular child star. Okay. She was the money spinner of that period. So, it is uh, uh, unthinkable for us that a child, uh, that a small kid can draw in those kinds of crowds, but it was, uh, it was the truth. She was very pretty, very uh, lovable and the Americans loved her as their own daughter. So, she starred in a spate of very successful movies including Haiti in 1937. And she was so popular, they would uh, invite her to compare the Academy Awards and to give away the best actress award also. And she it was we were told that uh, we are told that uh, she would often go off to sleep and then her parents have to wake her up that go now it is your turn just give the best actor award and come back and we will go home. So, she was that popular. RKO we have all recently done RKO a great movie the canonical text Citizen Kane. One of uh, its most prominent owners was Howard Hughes who was he? The aviator. Okay, thank Martin Scorsese for making all these people familiar to you. So, Leonardo DiCaprio has played Howard Hughes in The Aviator and he was one of the owners of RKO studio. There was a period when they uh, directed movies with Fred uh, or produced movies with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Who were they? A singing dancing couple, a great team okay, and great uh, a series of musicals starring Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And then they were also known for literary adaptations, Little Women directed by the great George Cukor. Now, what is George Cukor no, famous for? Who was George Cukor? What has he made? Okay, this is your homework. Work on George. Find out who was Robert Town, who was George Cukor. Okay, these are the names you should know. Of Human Bondage, it's a novel by Somerset Mom. And The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Columbia Pictures, another major studio of the time, founded by the dreaded Henry Kahn. And when the other day, when we were talking about the Godfather and the uh, head of the horse scene. Um, where we are told, uh, this is you know one of the inside stories, part of Hollywood uh, anecdotes that uh, the producer's role was based on Henry Kahn. Of course, nobody sent him a horse's head, but he was threatened by the mafia to uh, that he has to employ Frank Sinatra from for from here to eternity. Uh, Columbia Pictures major movies of that period, only angels have wings and his girl Friday, both directed by the great Howard Hawks. And why are we interested in Howard Hawks? He is one of the first Hollywood authors. The French critics of Cahiers du Cinema headed by Andre Bezon, they recognize Howard Hawks as one of the most prominent directors, a true author of the golden age period. One is Howard Hawks and another is Hitchcock according to the and of course, Orson Welles. Any comments here on a studio system on production code? All these movies are post code, His Girl Friday, John Ford's movies, Howard Hawks films. Okay, so, uh, following 10 commandments, movies were under this period, movies had to adhere to the um, code, the production code. What would that entail? Of course, you have to cut down on sex and violence, but what would that also entail otherwise? What to make movies about stories that didn't rely so much on sex and violence. Okay. I think even married couples were shown sleeping in separate beds. Okay, that is interesting. Okay. But by and large, uh, they, uh, Hollywood producers and directors were encouraged to make those movies, which would adhere to the dominant ideology. So, remember that. 
cater to the dominant ideology. So, if uh, the dominant ideology tells you that all um, uh, communists are bad, then cinema necessarily must include that, that should be the closure. If all, uh, if the dominant ideologies tells you that uh, you cannot show divorce on screen, then uh, they have to show, uh, the couple has to be shown being happily, married happily ever after or something like that. They lived happily ever after, that kind of scenario. Okay. And of course, language, okay, lang there has to be complete control over the kind of language characters would speak on screen. Okay. New wave Hollywood changed all that, okay, but then we will, when we will discuss all that, uh, that when we go and discuss the new, the uh, counterculture American cinema and the new Hollywood cinema. Frank Capra and he is the man who embodied the all American values, he is credited for that. So, 1897 to 1991, Capra was a Sicilian immigrant and Columbia's star director. His movies are now called fantasies of goodwill, okay. the feel good pictures. He won uh, the academy award three times for best direction. Some of his uh, uh, films uh, or some of his early films were comedies, but then soon he settled down in the role of preacher of American values, the core value American values and he became their spokesman. Yes, he did. His movies now are remembered for their sentimental, utopian and populist themes. What do you understand by utopian populist themes? again catering to the dominant ideology. And uh, uh, when do filmmakers become populist? Trying to reach out to the masses, as many people as possible, giving the public what it wants. So, now again I will come to our um, showman Manmohan Desai, who made a movie Amar Akbar Anthony and there is a scene where uh, it is a lost and found formula okay, and Manmohan Desai had perfected the art, the formula lost and found. So, in every uh, movie of his, in the first reel families would scatter, in the last reel they would all reunite. Now, the hero invariably Amitabh Bachchan, the mother invariably Nirupar Roy, the father invariably Pran or some someone similar okay, so, and they would all come together, live happily ever after. Okay. Heroines were not much important, they were just like props, they would come sing, love interests, look pretty, disappear. At the end they would come out as like nice daughters in law of a nice middle class Indian family. So, there is a closure, okay. families disperse and they unite and now families are completed because there are daughters in law as well, appropriate kind of daughters in law. That is very important, I mean Diwar, one of our greatest melodramas, the bad girl is killed off, although there is an attempt to marry her off to the rebellious son, she is killed off, the good girl becomes the daughter in law of the family. So, that was important, so giving the public what it wants, catering to the dominant ideology, because the bad girl who smokes and drinks and has dubious morals, you can, cannot show her living happily ever after, she deserves to be punished some way or the other, right. We all, so, that is our populist cinema, melodramatic and populist. So, this is what Frank Capra believed in, populist, melodramatic, utterly sentimental. Most of his films had the theme of a lone folksy hero from a small town, okay. so it is a wonderful life okay. uh, and that hero overcoming corrupt forces, politicians, who are the corrupt people? Politicians, lawyers, 
bankers. <laughs> okay, these are the corrupt people and city sophisticates. Because the city people are always bad. So, our Raj Kapoor and our other great directors of that period, they drew on from cinema of Frank Capra. Frank Capra's influence is phenomenal. Okay, whatever today film his scholars may think of him, there was a period when Capra was God. And I have a local film historian, I would not tell you his name, you can meet me after the class and I will tell you. The, yeah, but he once told me that he visited Frank Capra's mansion uh, in Beverly Hills and there was this huge picture of Frank Capra. Now, the estate is managed by his descendants, his sons and grandsons and uh, our man had taken a garland and he said, you are my guru. Okay, so, that kind of reverence is given to Frank Capra, especially from our part of the world, because we believe in this kind of cinema, right? Utopian, melodramatic, sentimental, populist, restoring of family as a unit. There should be a harmony, which should be restored. Okay, so, Capra preached that and he has any number of acolytes in any part of the world. Traditional values, his, so his movies are known for traditional values and cozy optimism, all is well with the world, do not worry, you are good, the, uh, if you are good you will be paid, you will be rewarded, evil will always be punished, may not happen necessarily in real life, in real world, but in Frank Capra, yes it did and it gave you a sense of cozy optimism. Film historians today, internationally, uh, they uh, rubbish his works to be morally trite, you know too easy going, too cozy, too accessible and out of touch with reality, it does not really happen this way, but that is what he was. So, his major films, it happened one night, what is it all about? Dil hai ke manta nahi, do you remember that? Pooja Bhatt Amir Khan directed by Mahesh Bhatt. A wealthy girl, uh, a runaway bride, okay, she is supposed to, uh, she wants to marry a particular man and who her father thinks is not really suitable. So, um, she runs off and on the way she meets this very uh, witty and uh, a very irreverential kind of a journalist played by Clark Gable and uh, the heiress is played by Claudette Colbert. And then what happens, how the plot develops? Mr. Deeds goes to Washington, Gary Cooper, Mr. Deed goes to town, sorry, and Mr. Smith goes to Washington, starring James Stewart. Meet John Doe again with the great Gary Cooper. What is it about? John Doe is an everyman, a regular American guy. It is about a regular guy who fights against the corrupt politicians and also corrupt media. Okay. And a, a very, a very impacting, a very forceful kind of a movie, all of us must watch that. I think of all his movies, apart from It is a Wonderful Life, Meet John Doe is a certainly uh, most influential. It is a wonderful life, one of his last films starring James Stewart. Capra was also commissioned by the US Army, now see all the values he has been preaching. So, he has to be rewarded and he was commissioned by the US Army to make a seven part documentary series on war, it was called Why We Fight okay. and he won several awards for that. And, uh, highly rewarded series, rewarded and awarded series and he was uh, much respected after that. He was, he became the moral preacher, the guiding force of morality in America soon after that. He attempted to form his own company along with George Stevens and we are going to look at George Stevens soon and the great William Wyler. It was called Liberty Films. But the company uh, was so soon sold out to other forces. His autobiography is called The Name Above the Title, 
is like Kapola's The Godfather, Kapra's is It Happens One Night, when the director becomes so powerful, his name is above the title. His influence, his legacy continues. Critics have observed that uh, his influence on people like John Ford, Satyajit Ray and the great Japanese director Ozu is extremely visible and palpable. He won the Lifetime Achievement Award in 1982. So, we will continue uh, with classic Hollywood tomorrow. Thank you very much. And do your research on George Cukor. <laughs>